Well, hello, I'm Janice Liversidge, and I'm going to be talking this morning about Florence Nightingale and Victorian London. I'm uh, John Baines Tours tour leader. Um, um, I've led five, I think five or six tours in different countries around the world. And I was due this May time, in fact, as I'm talking now, to be leading a tour of Florence Nightingale in the UK. Um, I'm not only a tour leader, but I'm also a London Blue Badge tourist guide. So what I'm going to be talking about um, is um, Victoria London and Florence Nightingale and 10 advances and innovations and indeed events which had an impact on life in London and indeed the rest of the UK during the 19th century. And I'd say it is a quite an eclectic mix. It's my choice. Um, I hope you find it interesting. And from time to time, I've, weave, I've, I've tried to weave in some references to London and places you might be able to come and visit um, once the lockdown for coronavirus is over. So let's get going. Now, 2020 is the bicentenary of the birth of Florence Nightingale, the 12th of May. And on this chart here, you'll see the blue line, blue block, showing you know, her birth in 1820, and she died then in 1910. And for most of her life on the throne was Queen Victoria. The green block below shows the Victorian era, the years when Queen Victoria um, was Queen of um, Britain um, from 1837 to 1901. In fact, Victoria was born just a year before Florence Nightingale. So we celebrated her bicentenary last year. And on this slide, you can see the whole range of things from things like the London Library opening, the Factories Act, through to the Great Exhibition and changes in education with Education Acts. These are the, all the range of things that happened during um, Florence's life. And I'm going to touch on one or two of these, but also, as I say, some of my other favourites. I mean, Florence had a long life, you know, she lived for 90 years. And really, most of the time, all we really think about is that well, period of just under two years when she was at the Crimean War, but she was so much more than that. You know, she was a statistician, she was a, um, a campaigner, healthcare campaigner, an innovator, um, a social reformer who, who really, I think, changed the world. You know, I don't think that's too great a claim. Now, let's have a look at the first of our 10 changes or innovations, and this is the Postal Service. Now, in 1837, when Queen Victoria came to the throne, the British postal system was very, very complex and postal rates were incredibly difficult. It was normal for the recipient of a letter to pay the postage on delivery and you were charged by the number of sheets and the distance travelled. So you can imagine how complicated this was and people didn't really receive all that many letters. Now, a gentleman called Sir Roland Hill proposed that an adhesive stamp be um, provided to indicate prepayment of postage and allow for letters up to the, the weight of half an ounce, that's 14 grams, to be delivered at, at a flat rate of a penny, regardless of distance. And so on the, um, in May 1840, the very first stamp with Queen Victoria pictured on it was issued, the penny black. And you'll see on this graph here, the exponential growth of letters being um, received by people in the country. So we go from around 1840 when on average you've received perhaps six letters a year right through to let's look at I don't know 19, 1910, 1920 and here we've gone up um, this, at this point people are receiving about 117 letters each a year. Now not only do we get the postage stamp we also got post boxes um, to thank for this, we have the author, um, Anthony Trollope, who was working for the post office. And in 1853, he went to France and discovered that they had post boxes, came back and we introduced them here in, in Britain. Initially, they weren't red. So you can see in the background all these different red post boxes. They were green. So we have three samples here. As you can see, some of the letter slots are vertical, oh, pardon me, let's go back, were vertical, whilst others were horizontal. So there's no set design. Um, you can see here, 
on this post box VR, Victoria, Regina, Queen Victoria, indicating who, you know, that she was on the throne when, when these letter boxes were introduced. Um, but very shortly after they'd been established, um, they, they, the colour red was determined to be the, the colour for our post boxes, and that's what they are to this day. Um, you can see these, and indeed, the postal rail or postal railway um, where the packages were delivered across London but underground at what is now the Postal Museum near Mount Pleasant, Mount Pleasant um, near King's Cross Station. You can see um, the little the old postal railway is now converted. It's no bigger than it was. So you can see I'm I'm actually pictured in here rather cramped because um, I'm pretending to be a a sack of post really but it's well worth a visit especially if you've got young children um, and will be open one, one hopes later this year now with the advent of the postal service and post boxes we had the very first commercial christmas cards this one is is is, is the very first one that we, we could publicly buy um, it was the brainchild of sir henry cole who will come across later in our presentation again and he commissioned this first commercial print run, um, sent them out to his friends and then sold the, the, the residue on. And in the centre you have a family looking very jolly, celebrating Christmas, um, no social distancing here. But on the left and the right, left you have here Christian charity, an act of philanthropy, feeding of the poor, and on the right, the clothing of the poor and we'll come back to philanthropy later in our presentation. Now we find that Florence Nightingale um, adopted this new invention with gusto and during her life she wrote over 14,000 letters. This one here um, on the slide was written as you can see in 1855 and she's addressing it from the Barrack Hospital in Scutari and it's addressed to a certain Mr Herbert. This is Sidney Herbert who is the Secretary of State for War. And um, she wrote this when she was in the Crimea um, and she had been appointed, he, in fact Sidney Herbert had appointed her to lead um, a party of 38 nurses to the hospital of Scutari um, in modern day Istanbul in Turkey. And she arrived in November 1854, just a few days after the Battle of Balaclava and the disastrous charge of the Light Brigade. And she found herself in the middle of a crisis. The military hospital was overwhelmed by wounded men. It was insanitary, it was dirty. And it, in this letter, she reports on her success in reducing the death rate. At its height, it was 52%. And she insists in somewhat plain language in this letter um, of her need for trained nurses rather than fat, drunken old dames. Um, I'll be telling you a little bit more about the reputation of nurses as we go through this presentation. Now, this letter, together with over 800 volumes of correspondence and papers, can be seen at the British Library. In fact, I discovered recently that it's the second lar largest archive that they hold after that of the Prime Minister um, William Gladstone another Victorian um, and you could when you visit the British Library you can see a whole range of highlights you know everything from the Magna Carta um, documents like this through to um, or even the, the lyrics of the, of, of the Beatles songs on it written on a napkin and I you can also whilst the British Library is closed you can also um, view um, uh, quite a lot of the letters and transcripts of her letters um, online, so maybe worth having a look at. So let's go on to number two. What other changes um, were taking place? Well, transportation. Until the 19th century, available um, was really on horseback, horses and carriages, or perhaps the watermen, you know, who would, would row you across the River Thames. Then we had an explosion in the 19th century. And here, um, in this illustration or this photograph, we see Schillebeer's omnibus. This was the forerunner of today's red buses that you see in London. And this was um, established in 1829 by a gentleman called George Schillebeer, providing the first cheap public transportation in London. It took you, the route took you from Paddington in the west 
to the City of London at Bank, um, all this for a shilling, including free newspapers. We also find the birth of the railway shortly after in 1837 um, with the establishment of London Bridge Station and in the following year Paddington. Paddington Station is shown here in this rather majestic painting by William Powell Frith. Now Queen Victoria took her first royal train journey from um, Slough um, to Paddington Station. Um, Slough being the nearest station to Windsor Castle. Um, and as you can imagine, she, she did this, um, at, it was at great speed, in fact, far too fast for her. She wasn't that keen on it. Um, it was 60 miles an hour and she did this in 1842. Now I, I checked up and part of the journey from Florence Nightingale going to the Crimea was to take a train. Um, she took a train from London Bridge early on the morning of the 23rd of October bound for Folkestone where she then connected with a Boulogne packet, um, that's a kind of travel service, and then um, we find she, the entire expedition set off the next day to Lyon, reaching Valence by boat down the Rhone and from there taking the train to Marseille. So she, she was a user of, of, of this new invention and I rather like the story somewhat later in her life when she was visiting her sister, Partenope, and her husband um, in um, Sir Harry Verney, um, and took the train um, from London. Now, um, on that train journey, her cats accompanied her, though it could prove hazardous transporting them on the train journey, it reports. I'm reading this from um, Mark Ostridge's very good biography of Florence Nightingale, which I highly recommend. And um, returning to London from Clayton in the autumn of 1885, Florence was alarmed. I love this. It says, when Quiz, a Persian kitten, jumped out of the window onto the track at Watford and scampered out of sight. I summoned all the station masters in England to my assistance. Florence announced with a dramatic flourish. He of Watford was sent back along the line to find Quiz and telegraphed Florence later that evening, cat found, not hurt. Quiz spent the night in the Euston Parcels office, that's Euston Station, and was returned to her grateful mistress the next morning, shocked but alive and singing. Um, I think she could be referred to perhaps as a crazy cat lady. Um, Florence had more than 70 cats during her lifetime, believe it or not. Right, so um, we've got the railways, we've got Shillibeer's Omnibus. We also, London also had its very own form of transportation in the new underground system from 1863. And the first line was from Paddington, again, in, as I mentioned, where the railway station was in the west, to Farringdon in the city. Um, and it used a technique called cut and cover, where the road was literally dug up, lines laid, the tunnels made um, for the steam trains, and then recovered. Um, and by the end of the Victorian period, the, this had grown hugely, going right out to the green fields of the countryside and made famous in the poet laureate John Betjeman's um, 1973 film, Metroland. Um, and again, I'm reading a little bit um, from, from, from the poetry that he wrote, um, because this is an area near where um, Florence's sister and her husband, um, Harry Verney, lived um, at Claydon House. So that this was near Aylesbury, um, which is where the, the, um, the trains went to and also the, the underground. Steam took us onwards through the ripening fields, ripe for development where the landscape yields, clay for warm brick, timber for post and rail, through Amersham to Aylesbury and the Vale. In those wet fields, the railway didn't pay, the metro stops at Amersham today. So no longer the underground. Now, um, that wasn't the final form of transportation that was, um, came to fruition in the Victorian period, 1896, we saw motor vehicles on Britain, Britain, Britain's roads for the first time. And since 1927, we've had an annual celebra celebration of motor vehicles um, and the ability to go at a new maximum speed of 14 miles per hour. That's one four, 14. 
Um, and this annual celebration takes the form of the London to Brighton Veteran Car Run. And you can see this annually on the first Sunday of November. Um, and it leaves from Hyde Park at dawn. Here's a group I, I took a picture of um, a couple of years ago. It really is worth getting up for. Um, great fun and lots of people dress up. Um, so hopefully that might be taking part, that might be taking, um, taking place later this year. Now another major advance and one which involves the Crimea War is the introduction of photography. Now you might sometimes think of um, people like the Frenchman Louis Daguerre who introduced his um, photographic process and, um, and then Fox Talbot in England. But um, I want to talk about another person who was involved in photography, pioneer of this. Now, here's a photo of Florence Nightingale, a slim, um, young, slim woman until her middle age and quite tall, really, at five foot eight. But she did not like having her photograph taken um, and often refused to sit for photographs, only sometimes allowing it at the request of Queen Victoria. Now, here she is somewhat later in years in her room in South Street, 1906. So this is just four years before she died. And um, she did spend an awful lot of time in bed as, um, already after she came back from the Crimea because she suffered what we believe now from, um, what we believe it, she suffered from was brucellosis. So she was not a well woman after coming back um, from the Crimean War. But um, during the period of the Crimean War, Roger Fenton, gentleman in this photograph, um, was the very first to witness the use of um, photography to record war when he was um, commissioned by the government to go out there and take photographs. Now you see him here looking very stern um, and I think that's perhaps the, the length of time that you had to sit still to have your photograph taken. Um, and as I say, he went out to the Crimea. His was the first attempt to record war um, during the period from March to June 1855 as the official campaign photographer um, and was working with um, journalists who were able to um, report on the war using a new telegraph system um, and send reports back to newspapers such as the Times. Now, he never managed to capture the battles um, or wounded soldiers, but he took incredibly impactful images of campaigns um, and everyday life. And here we have the dirt road, a dirt road littered. You can you see in the foreground with um, cannonballs? Also, um, rather moving the cemetery at Cathcart's Hill here as well. Um, Fenton took this photograph, this very sombre, striking image during the civil, during the Crimean War, and we believe it's the first case of someone um, with suspected combat PTSD. Um, and those eyes just very, very haunting. Um, and this was the first time it's documented in photography. And the man in question here is Lord Balgoni. Now, although, although Florence wasn't very keen on photography, Queen Victoria took to it. And um, she is pictured here later in her life with her grandchildren at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, just five years before she died. And the Queen and her husband, Prince Albert, were very enthusiastic supporters of this new technology and became early patrons of the Photographic Society. Right, let's move on to a different world, a world of medicine. Now, until the 18, early 1800s, medicine was almost medieval, um, with preparations of arsenic being used, doctors you know, re um, recommending a change of air, uses of leeches in bleeding, in bleeding. And people suffered from, oh, typhoid, cholera, scarlet fever, TB, whooping cough, rickets, smallpox, and they were all common. And medicine, as I say, was a mix of probably, you know, scary things and quackery. But 19th century saw some great advances, including the establishment of the General Medical Council, and regulating doctors, and in 1858, the trade union, the British Medical, the trade union, British Medical Association. Sorry, 1856, the BMA was established. And here in this picture, you see um, Robert Liston, the surgeon. He was known as the fastest knife in the West End, and he used to say 
tiny gentleman, tiny, uh, it was said that he could amputate a leg in less than 30 seconds. Um, now, here he is again. Now, you probably want your leg to be amputated rather, rather quickly because until this period, there were no anaesthetics. Not until in Britain, when he did the very first operation using a new anaesthetic, ether, at University College Hospital in London in 1846. Um, he had the rather um, unfortunate claim to fame also of having um, undertaken an operation where there was a 300% mortality rate. Um, not only did the patient die of gangrene, one observer um, fainted, hit their head um, and died from the wound, and another was cut by his knife, by Liston's knife, and also died from gangrene. Um, now, the kind of conditions he was working in can be seen at the old operating theatre in London. Um, this, is, this is how it looks today, but it has, isn't very much changed from how it would have been originally as an operating theatre. And this is um, near London Bridge Station. So um, one hopes later this year it, it will reopen and you'll be able to go and explore that and the herb garret also the herbs that we use for medicinal purposes. And just as an aside, I'd say that Queen Victoria adopted the use of anaesthetic anaesthesia herself when she um, used it in the form of chloroform for the birth of her last two children in 1855 and 1857. And her adoption of that um, led to more widespread use of, of it in, in childbirth. Now, reputedly present at Liston's operation was um, a young medical student who afterwards graduated from University College Hospital and went up to Edinburgh and his name, we see him here in the centre here, his name was Joseph Lister, responsible for the advancing, uh, advances in the use of antiseptics and later aseptic surgery where you're excluding germs for operations um, by sterilising equipment, um, um, and, and used for, you know, for dressings, um, ensuring surgeon's hands and patient's skin were, were all clean, they were all sterilised. And that too helped to reduce the mortality rate. Um, later in years, he came um, back to London to live. And um, in fact, he had quite a hard time as his advances, advance wasn't readily accepted by London doctors. But thanks to him, we did have antiseptic and aseptic surgery. And he's now honoured with his bust shown here um, I took this photo not long ago in the sunshine of Portland Place in central London. Now, during this period, obviously Florence Nightingale um, trained as a nurse and was asked to go to Scutari. And this image here is one that you probably recognise, you know, her at the wards in, in the hospital at the Crimea. Crimea but the hospital when she arrived was insanitary you know there were rats there were no beds for the for the soldiers they didn't have regular meals there was no fresh air disease was rife and indeed four times more soldiers died in the hospital than on the battlefield and she recognized um, the need for you know all these changes for beds for meals for cleanliness for washing hands um, um, and and she kept detailed notes and statistics which she used later on her return um, producing a report um, I think of some 800 pages for the government on you know on what went wrong. Um, now this image isn't totally accurate because the lamp that we see is was actually one like this. This is um, what she did use was a a folding Turkish paper candle lantern called a fanous. Um, um, and I think this lamp became the symbol of, of compassion in the Crimea. And there's a link between the changes that she was trying to undertake at the Crimea um, Hospital and London. Um, and this brings us to the fifth of our changes. And this is the one of sanitation. Here in this image, we have Gustave Doré's London, a pilgrimage from 1872. And it brilliantly captures the overcrowding and poverty in one of the largest and richest cities of Europe. You can see people here, the squalor, the dirt in the backyards. Now London had seen, London had seen a huge um, explosion in its population. 
1700, the year 1700, we had half a million people. By 1800, just a century later, this had doubled to a million. And then from 1800 to 1900, the population increased to five and a half million. So we had overcrowding, insanitary conditions, poverty, squalor. And in 1858, this led to something called the Great Stink. Um, all the human waste, industrial waste, animal waste was going into the River Thames. And it got so bad that in 1858, um, the, 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 the smell, because it was a warm summer, was, was absolutely horrendous. And we see here um, old Father Thames being um, delivered notice, um, you know, someone holding their nose there because it was just so smelly. And um, it said that vinegar, vinegar soaked sheets had to be hung at the windows of the Houses of Parliament to um, get rid of the stench whilst the MPs were sitting um, in Parliament. And at long last, this led to the appointment of a gentleman called Sir Joseph Bazalgette. Um, and he's seen here, uh, oh, sorry, he's seen here in this um, photo, um, looking very grand. But he was responsible for the building of the embankments of the River Thames. Um, narrowing the river, so the Victoria Embankment, the Albert Embankment, for example, and the sewage system. Um, he, had, he had the foresight to build the sewer system of London for a much larger capacity um, than the, the then existing population. And it's only now in 20, 2020 that we're seeing an expansion of this with the building of the new super sewer for London. We also had a problem with cholera in the 1850s. Um, the person who um, I mentioned, um, Queen Victoria, using anaesthesia for the births of her, of her two last children, and the doctor who um, was with her um, and gave this to her was a certain Dr John Snow. Now he also had a much greater claim to fame, which is that he identified the cause of an incidence of cholera in London Soho in 1854. And the epicenter of this was the Broad, in Broad Street and the Broad Street pump. The, the, uh, the deaths from cholera was so great in this area that um, Florence Nightingale, who at that stage was superintendent of a hospital in Marylebone, went to nurse the sick and dying at the Middlesex Hospital just off Tottenham Court Road um, and only just a bit further north of, of, this, of this map. Um, and um, many patients and also a fellow nurse died catching it from patients so that sort of chimes with me certainly at the moment with COVID-19. Now John Snow mapped the cases of cholera and identified that the, the cause was in one area was the water supply, the water supply by a pump in Broad Street and what he did um, to, to, to prove this was to take the handle off the pump. Here's the, here's the pump, no handle. Um, and he, his views were, were vindicated. Uh, many thought it was miasma or bad air that caused cholera, but he showed that it was a, a contaminated water supply that, 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 that had caused it. And the pump has been recently restored and is now outside. Um, the John Snow pub, and um, rather ironic, as I recently discovered that John Snow was was himself teetotal. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so a major, major, major advances in healthcare, which takes us on to change number six, which is edu was education. Now, in the 1830s, only one third of children attended school, um, and these 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 tended to be very wealthy. They, they were wealthy people. Um, you know, if you were a boy, you'd have a tutor. And then when you got to your teenage years, you, you'd attend public school, something like um, Westminster in London or maybe Eton near Windsor. Um, and people like Florence Nightingale, you know, whose families were well placed, she had a tutor and then was taught by her father. Um, and he expected both his daughters, her um, Parthenope, Parthenope Florence's older sister and herself, he expected them to study, um, study, study well. And at the age of 16, um, I managed to find out that Florence was studying chemistry, geography, 
physics, astronomy, mathematics, grammar, composition, philosophy, history, French, Italian, German, Latin and Greek. I have to say this was pretty unusual um, for women of her, of her age and um, her upbringing to be so well educated. But at this time, there were no laws requiring attendance at school and no public or rather free education. So what happened was that industrialists um, started to establish things called ragged schools. We have here um, one that was established, as you can see, in 1846, ragged and industrial schools. Industrial because founded by you know, an industry monies, um, industrialists who'd, who'd got um, made rich really because of the Industrial Revolution, and ragged because the kids were coming to school in, 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 in a really poor clothing. And it provided free basic education to, the orf to orphans and the poor. Um, the, this one had a report written saying 240 um, children. Some of these are the children of thieves and fallen women. Others are the offspring of Irish Romanies, a most difficult class to manage. So they also had night school and Sunday schools. It's no longer a school, but the building can be seen in Marylebone. And um, I just wanted to have a little look at this graph here where we show, look, look how the literacy rates really changed. You know, women, um, you know, really right through until the 1820s, 30s, you know, still only just over 40% literacy rate. But um, the whole series of laws came in through the Victorian period. And by 1880, there was compulsory education for all those aged five to 10. And the 1891 Free Education Act meant that the state paid the school fees of up to 10 shillings a week. And by 1893, um, the leaving age for school was 13. And you can see, you know, by just before the year 1900, you know, literacy rates are really right up in the 90s and women have caught up with the men. Now, this takes us on to our last of the changes I wanted to talk about in this part of the presentation um, and philanthropy. Um, you might recognise here this being Charles and um, being um, Piccadilly Circus. And here we have what's called the Shaftesbury Memorial Fountain. Um, um, I think often today it's referred to as let's, um, the, the Fountain of Eros, the, the, this god here with his bow and arrow. In fact, it's his brother Anteros, the god of selfless love. It was rather controversial when it was put up in 1893 because the, um, the, the god on the top is, is naked. Um, but it, it was made, commemorated Lord Shaftesbury and it has a bit of a pun in that he's looking across to Shaftesbury Avenue, Theatreland today, and he has his arrow, his, his bow, and it's said that the, the arrow is buried, um, the shaft is buried in the ground, so Shaftesbury. Um, he was a philanthropist and, as we saw, was one of those who supported the introduction of, of ragged schools. He also got involved um, in the field of transport. Now, we talked about um, the different forms of transport and one of them was the use of um, a handsome cab, the equivalent of our black cabs today. And the driver, as you'll see, um, was outside the cab or outside, you know, outside the carriage in all weathers. Um, great if it was a sunny day, but when it was raining, you, you didn't want to get wet. So they would often um, hunker down in the local public house and would perhaps drink a little bit too much. Um, there were about 5,000 of them in London by 1860. And one particular gentleman, Captain Armstrong, had wanted to use one of the, the cabs to go home one day. And the, because it had been raining, the driver was a little bit on the drunk side. And so he came up with the idea with Lord, Char um, Lord Charlesbury of founding the Cabman's Shelter Fund. And 60 shelters were established in central London. Now you can see one here. Um, they're all green um, and no larger than the size of a horse and carriage. Um, they look a bit like a, I think a bit like a cricket pavilion. Um, 14 still remain in London today. This one um, is on the side of Russell Square, but perhaps the one that you might come across um, if you ever go to South Kensington to the Victorian Albert Museum is the one in the middle of the road there. And they serve taxi drivers or handsome cab drivers to this day with hot meals and drinks. 
and the shelter rules are that there's no gambling, no drinking, no alcohol drinking, no swearing and no politics. Not sure if all those rules are followed. Um, and even today, um, as I say, they're in use. Now, we as members of the public can go up to the counter here. Can you see there's a little counter and there's a sign saying egg and bacon or sausage and egg sandwich, I think for just two, a roll, just for £2.80. We can buy from the outside and take food away, but we're not allowed inside. The only people allowed inside are taxi drivers. Now, another form of philanthropy um, is that of social housing, which was established later in the 19th century. This is the first property in Spitalfields, um, uh, built in 1864 by someone called George Peabody, or George Peabody, a wealthy businessman, um, an American, not, not actually British, um, who made his money importing wool and linen before then moving into merchant banking. And he came to London, became acutely aware of the poverty and the squalor, um, and wanted to do something to help and Lord Shaftesbury suggested that he could set up low rent housing so dwellings I think they were described for artisans um, and labourers uh, artisans and the labouring poor of London and the Peabody um, estates Peabody trusts um, continue to this day um, and there's a statue of George Peabody just near the Royal Exchange at Bank um, in, in the city of London so we've got the housing and Finally, um, we have hospitals. Now, if you were wealthy, then you didn't go to hospital. Doctors came to your home for treatment. And public hospitals were very much for the poor. Um, now, although there was some form of hospitals for the poor, um, when we were looking in the middle of the 19th century, 40% of the deaths of people in London um, were under the were, were children under the age of 16. So you've got 40% of them dying and 40% of the deaths in London being children, but only 6% of the hospital inpatients were children. Um, often families want, would keep children at home, they couldn't afford for hospital treatment. The, you know, the children were often seen, you know, large families were seen as replaceable. Um, but it was in 1851 that the first UK's, or, or the UK's first purpose-built hospital for children um, was, was opened. It had been championed by Dr Charles West, who galvanised a group of, of, of rich um, supporters to raise funds and it, these included Angela Burdett Coops of the Coops banking family and also Charles Dickens who made um, and undertook readings of his novels um, and he got involved because he lived near where the hospital was established and the hospital in question is Great Ormond Street Hospital and um, close by the house that he lived in in Doughty Street has been converted into a museum in his name. Um, another place well worth a visit if you're coming to London. Um, and well, I'll just show you what it looks like today. This is the, um, the main entrance. Um, so also by another local resident who was approached to make a donation, but um, asked them to come back um, when he, he wanted to have a little think about it. And um, he, what he did was he did more than just give a little donation. Um, you'll recognise here, this is Peter Pan, the little boy, the boy who never grew up with his companion um, on his finger, Tinkerbell here. And what the author, J.M. Barry, the author of Peter Pan did, who lived nearby, was to give the rights to his novel to, his novel, to the hospital, the copyright. And um, after he died, this continued, and whereas normally that would finish after 70 years, the copyright law runs out, it's been extended. So still to this day, Great Ormond Street receive an income from the novel um, Peter Pan. Um, and, you know, at the same time, Florence Nightingale was working hard on her return from the Crimea as a social reformer um, to also upgrade the workhouse infirmaries. You know, in the workhouses, there was bed sharing, there was a lack of cleanliness. You know, the same issues that she'd faced in the Crimea, she campaigned to um, get the, um, the workhouse hospitals separate from the workhouses and improve the conditions. <laughs> 
So that really takes us um, to the end of our first part of the presentation. We've covered seven different areas. Um, part two to follow tomorrow. Um, you'll be able to watch it on, on video, I hope, afterwards. And we'll learn about more of the places visited and, and things experienced by Florence Nightingale. And just a quick final call out um, in 2020, the Florence Nightingale Museum has an exhibition on, well, it did have an exhibition on, but unfortunately the museums had to close because of coronavirus. And it's under threat of permanent closure because of the lack of funds. So if you get an opportunity, go and visit this webpage um, and perhaps give a, a small donation or buy some of their merchandise, maybe buy the book that I've recommended. I think you can buy it online. Um, so um, that's it until part two. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.